some, many people, in fact, not some, would imagine that carbohydrates are an essential macronutrient. Hmm. What do you think? Well, the premise of this um, mistaken belief actually comes around on the basis that the, the belief that carbohydrates are essential for metabolism of the brain. So we know that the brain can metabolize glucose. And we also know that some cells in the body, such as the red blood cells, our erythrocytes have an obligate need for glucose. But the simple fact is there's two things that counter this. So the glucose that the body needs to function, it can make. So we have a process called gluconeogenesis, which is performed within the liver. And gluconeogenesis can use either protein, certain specific amino acids, or glycerol, which is uh, part of the triglyceride fat. So we can literally break down fat to produce glucose if we need to. So the need of glucose in the body can be met by non-carbohydrate sources. Mm -hmm. And what people also don't realize is that the brain has an amazing capacity to use ketones, which can be a byproduct of fat metabolism for energy. Um, that the absolute need for glucose metabolism in the brain in the setting of sufficient ketones is actually very, very low. And I'll just, I'll just take a little bit of a tangent here to describe how interesting this belief is. And, and it is well recognized now, I believe the Institute of um, Medicine in the United States now recognizes that carbohydrates are not an essential nutrient. Um, but somehow we've put carbohydrates up on a pedestal as something that's necessary for brain function. And I'll just ask if we're having a look at the developing brain, um, well, that 60% of the brain is actually made of fat, 25% of which is cholesterol. And for the brain to actually be built, the, the, it's actually constituted of ketone bodies that have crossed the blood brain barrier because they're water soluble and then are able to be converted into the fats that form the structure of the brain. Yeah. So for developing brains and children and infants, it's actually, we know that they're, they're basically born into ketosis, bread fed infants are in a strong state of ketosis and children by their metabolisms will enter ketosis far more readily mm -hmm. than will adults. And this is only natural and desirable because this actually allows the part of the brain to be formed. So it's quite interesting if we're actually looking at whether for optimal bone, uh, brain health, it would be desirable to be on a carbohydrate fed diet, say rice cereals and things like that, or perhaps an animal based diet that might be more supportive of ketosis. Uh, if you actually have a look at the biochemistry of it, the diet in ketosis is far likely to support brain development. Yes. And I, I think it's actually really important, Paul, that you make the point that a breastfed child is essentially in ketosis. Oh, it, it absolutely is. So, you know, in the vicinity of 50% of the energy in breast milk can come from saturated fats. Um, so this is, uh, you know, it's, it's a very, it's obviously got carbohydrate in it, it's obviously got protein in it, but it's got a lot of fat in it as well. So let, let, let me segue back to the sugars, because I think it's very important. You, you have mentioned that uh, as doctors, we have been taught and, and we know that carbohydrates is glucose and patients might not have understood it, but take us from there. Uh, patients now understand that their blood sugar level is high. And yes, oh, okay, it's coming from carbohydrates. Oh, shock horror. So where do you go from there? Well, I mean, it really, if you've already got a patient who is a diabetic, it's very easy because they often have access to continuous glucose monitors. There's a fantastic product on the market now called a Freestyle Libra. It's basically a small needle. It's the size of a 20 cent piece that sticks onto the back of your arm here. Um, and it samples the interstitial fluid and it's about a five minute delay behind the, uh, the blood glucose, but it gives you a real time trace 24 seven. So it communicates using near field connectivity with your mobile phone or the patient's mobile phone. So they can get a real time readout and each sensor costs $95. So it's not inexpensive. It lasts for two weeks they can get a real-time readout on exactly what their blood sugar is doing. 
And of course, as a clinician, I'm most interested in postprandial rises because that's what they've got most control of. And that's an amazing education tool. Mm -hmm. If you educate a patient and saying, look, your sugar went to 14 here, you thought this meal of rice was healthy. Well, it's not healthy. You're, you're exceeding the renal reabsorption threshold here. And you thought your breakfast of porridge was good for you. Well, look, your blood sugar was 16. And you say, well, and here you had, you had salmon or you had a steak and you can barely even tell that you consumed a meal at that point in time. So in the last few years, this has absolutely revolutionized my practice because it's given patients far more meaningful feedback and I mean, as doctors, we always want the capacity to help our patients. And before we had continuous glucose meters, we relied on patients trusting us. And as you know, they don't always trust what we say, but if they can see it with their own eyes, um, there's no denying that. Mm. 